It is Friday, December 30th, 2022. My name is Sam Cedar. This is the five-time award-winning Majority Report. We are broadcasting live steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America, downtown Brooklyn, USA. Live to tape. Oh, live to tape. It's the final uh, best of of the year. And of course, it's Adolf Reed, Professor Emeritus of Political Science at the University of Pennsylvania, to discuss his recent book, The South, Jim Crow and Its Afterlives. Uh, this was first aired on March 21st of this year, of 2022. And we reprise it now. It was uh, one of the most highly desired, voted upon, nominated, requested. Requested is the word I was looking for. Yes. Best of of 2022. And uh, so and here it is so. today. And rightly so. Um, you will enjoy this one. Uh, today's program, we should say, also sponsored by, before I tell you the comedy offerings today, because that's the way we're doing it. We're doing comedy. and uh, But this program... Uh, sponsored by my favorite sponsor, not just of 2022, but uh, for years now, uh, sunsetlakecebeday.com. Well, you know, when we first got the this as a sponsor, I was like, I, I want to invest in this company. Mm -hmm. I didn't know how to do it. I didn't have the money to do it. And but I was like, this 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 is these products are great, and the 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 people who run the company are great. They're Majority uh, um, employee-owned business. They pay minimum wage of 20 bucks uh, per hour. They also use um, regenerative farming practices, so they take care of the land. They use integrated pest management, so they don't have any pesticides uh, or synthetic fertilizers on their uh, products. But they have a new hemp smokable flower and smalls. Those are the different types of, like... Um, buds i guess yeah. yeah uh they're smokables you don't need a promo code for this their uh, new 2022 hemp flower is uh their new cultivar is called candy kush it's a hybrid it's great for helping you ease into bed at night it'll mellow you out i use the sunset lake for uh, sleep for sure oh my it's gosh so helpful tinctures uh the fudge the gummies they have all sorts of different products there but they have this special uh, right now that exists until Sunday night, December 31st, 11.59 p.m. Uh, you can mix match cultivars to find your new favorite. There is no promo code needed. Uh, all of Sunset Lake Sebade's hemp flower will be buy one, get one free. Whoa. Or fray. I don't, I don't know why I did that. Uh, we got to say Sebade to avoid No, like, no, we get uh, it. We, uh... But uh, again, visit sunsetlakecebaday.com. Try these amazing new cultivars. Take advantage of this sale while it lasts. This is the time. Use 2022 to figure out which uh, type of, of um, you know, a plant really that you enjoy. Mm -hmm. And then 2023, dedicated, you're locked in. I mean, you can switch, but find out what you like. So check that out, uh, sunsetlakecebaday.com. And of course... Uh, if you use the coupon code uh, left is best, you get 20% off all their other products. Uh, and now for the final program of 2022, the final offering of the final program, we're going to start with, um, uh, with Adolf Reed and we're going to follow it up with this kid, Peter McIndoe with birds aren't real. Um, this was a contentious interview. Mm. I don't have conspiracy theorists on the program too often, but when I do, I push back. I don't, I'm not going to just let them uh, open field with this. So this kid, I rake through the coals mm. and um, it, I, I damaged him so badly. I think he moved to LA and then had to move back. He went to the hospital or something like that after this, but uh, I really put the hurt on him. And um, So just like trigger warning. Trigger warning, it's going to get a little contentious. Between me and this kid, uh, Peter McIndoe, if that's really his name, uh, with his contention. He's from the Birds Aren't Real organization, I guess. So wow. uh, enjoy this, folks. we got one more best of 
that actually we have so many best ofs we had to stretch we had to push into 2023 to do it and we'll do that on monday all right enjoy today's program We are back. Sam Cedar, Emma Vigeland. Oof, I folks. couldn't even get my own name out. <laughs> Sam Cedar, Emma Vigeland uh, on the Majority Report. Uh, I'd like to welcome back to the show after too long of a time, Professor Adolph Reed. He is a professor emeritus of political science at the University of Pennsylvania, author of The South, Jim Crow and its Afterlives. Uh, professor Reed, welcome back to the program. Oh, well, yeah, uh, yeah it's good to be back. Thanks for having me. <clears throat> Um, so now, <clears throat> I was trying to figure out how to characterize your book and I came up with auto ethnography. Um, <laughs> and it, it is, it is basically your, uh, uh, you know, stories of your experience, uh, living under Jim Crow, mm -hmm. uh, and, um, then making, uh, observations and, and, and arguments around that in terms of how it functioned expressing that sort of daily life uh, under Jim Crow. Let's, I want to start with something that's fairly remedial for folks. Okay. We, we describe for us, like what is, when we say Jim Crow, this is coming mm -hmm. out of, uh, uh, out of reconstruction. And um, what, what, what are we talking about? Well, it's really even a, a little later than uh, you know, reconstruction. I mean, I define it really, <clears throat> pardon me, my allergies are killing me um, as um, the social order based on codified uh, um, racial subordination and, and and the white supremacy that took shape in most of the South uh, after the defeat of the populist insurgency in the early 1890s. Um, um, because, uh, what, I mean, not even racial segregation uh, carried the kind of um, systemic meanings um, prior to you know, say 1890 that, that, that it did after. Uh, um, I, I mean, if you take for instance, um, segregation in, in public transportation, um, Charles Lofgren in, in, in a book called The Plessy Case is really, uh, does really great, great, great work on this that, um, you know, between emancipation and, and, and the Plessy case, um, states and localities across the South in some places Im imposed uh, segregation laws and then got rid of them and reimposed them. In some places they didn't have them, in some places they didn't have them, and then imposed them and then got rid of them. In some places they applied to trolleys, but not um, to steamboats, but, well, but some places vice versa. So, so the regime of racial segregation, as we typically think of it, um, didn't become consolidated as a political or or as a politically significant thing for whites or blacks, it you know, on a large scale, uh, till till the eighteen nineties. So I would say, um, yeah, I would delimit uh, the Jim Crow era basically as having formed and consolidated someplace between eighteen ninety and and the uh, World War One, depending on where you were, uh, and having. Uh, Begun to break down uh, indirectly after World World War II, and 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 at the back of it, as I pointed, or or, uh, or the back of it, as I pointed out often, was broken by the time I was eighteen years old, nineteen sixty five. Um, the I I we were trying to figure out who it was that we interviewed, um, who had talked about um, the essentially the, the the coups that took place during reconstruction mm -hmm. in South Carolina as a right. function of of white plantation owners 
uh, realizing that they could not motivate Appalachians enough over race to break up the populists and, um, uh, you know, I guess forming a political alliance with essentially uh, newly freemen. And uh, that they they ended up resorting to violence there, and 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 it in in is it your sense that um, to the extent that it begins to congeal, that Jim Crow laws were a function of of that? I mean, I feel like that's a big part of your argument is that it and it shows it's it is not that the racial elements of it in terms of intent or motivation were second order for another for, for an agenda that sort of precedes it. Oh yeah, I think you're absolutely right. Um, I think uh, I think you're probably thinking about North Carolina instead of South Carolina because in North Carolina, um, in the midst of pushback against populism, um, a statewide populist Republican fusion government, what was elected in 1894 and then re-elected with by, by bigger margins in 1896. And that's what prompted the push uh, uh, led by the Democratic Party in 1898 when a few years later, uh, former Governor uh, Aycock uh, commented that, you know, that we need the strength that comes from thinking all alike. And what that meant, of course, was all white people. And what that also meant was what was the Democratic Party, which he also said, the Democratic Party alone is uh, sufficient to meet our needs. But and the fact is, and. And, and look, I know for most people in this country, uh, you know, what happened before um, Martin Luther King or the image of, well, about Martin Luther King was uh, a kind of indistinguishable blur of the bad old timey times, right? From slavery to whatever came after slavery, which some people argued was worse than slavery. Um, but, but, but I think it's more useful for us to think of the 30 years between or say the 30 years after emancipation in 1865 as kind of a, a, a period of flux or even if you will kind, kind of and kind of an interregnum right between two two orders uh, you know, on which there was political contestation uh, at the grassroots level from the grassroots level up uh, about what the reconstructed South was going to be, what the status of blacks who are now technically citizens, in southern political economy and 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 southern life was going to be, and it's also the case that the planter merchant capitalist class um, was seemed in retrospect irrationally fearful of that possibility that you mentioned, right? That 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 um, that broken working class whites and blacks what would align um, you know, to overthrow them, and and if we think about how you know what the upper class. Um, sense of being overthrown is today, it uh, the stakes were pretty low, right? Uh, but uh, I'm mean, just as they are now, right? It was just as uh, just as say uh, you know the likes of Jeff Bezos <clears throat> and um, Elon Musk uh, think that having to pay taxes is like going on a forced march to Treblinka, right? <laughs> right. Uh, but I mean they were kind of like that then too. Uh, so in addition. To what happened in uh, in uh, you know North Carolina in the mid 1890s, uh, in Virginia in 1879, uh, a similar kind of coalition was elected statewide and elected uh, at the leadership, ironically or maybe not, of a former Confederate general named Mahone, took state power for a while in Virginia and passed a bunch of downwardly redistributive laws. Uh, but even beyond that, I mean, um, Freeling. William H. Freeling's book, uh, South Against the South, chronicles, uh, uh, you know, uh, the almost 300,000 white Southerners who didn't support the Confederacy and 100,000 or more who actively fought, fought for the Union against secession. And, and the wonderful historian of the Victoria Bynum uh, study, what, what I did a book on that topic too, but, but in addition, she her, uh, you know, she did the study of the Free State of Jones, which Gary Ross turned into a very much underappreciated film, but about a county in Mississippi, of all places, that seceded from the Confederacy and where like an interracial army of white farmers and, 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 and black runaways 
uh, fought uh, alongside the Union against the Confederacy. So, so it's not exactly that the governing class fears of, of this potential alliance were, were irrational. It's only from the later perspective, you know, after two, gener two or three generations of the imposition of solid South, South ideology that we might think, think that, you know, that, that, that all white people thought the same thing, basically. But the fact was uh, that, that they, and the populist in, insurgency just brought home to them that they really needed to do something about this once and for all. And the last thing I'll say about this is that it's noteworthy that disfranchisement happened after the defeat of populism. And, and not only 90% plus of all blacks were disfranchised, but depending on where you were, between a quarter to a third of whites were also disfranchised. And, and the result of it was that, that, that you know, at the center of gravity of Southern politics <clears throat> shifted sharply to reflect the interests of the ruling class, right? Or the capitalist, uh, the capitalist and plantation upper class. And when people ask, and this is the last thing I'll say, but when people you know, seek for reasons that say trade unionism is so much weaker in, in, in the South than, than it is elsewhere, you know, uh, uh, I mean, American academics tend to adduce culturalist explanations, right? So stuff like something about Southern culture or or endemic commitment to white supremacy or whatever. Fact is, you don't need to look any farther than disfranchisement because because um, uh, after the center of gravity of the Southern uh, electorate shifted sharply toward the property classes, there was no space for the emergence of a governor, John Altgeld, for instance, like in Illinois, who uh, supported the what what I mean, the Haymarket, um, what um, cr um, prisoners, right? Like against uh, the owners, right? Or like other governors and mayors and councils who were pro labor and and, and supported trade unionism, because in the South, like every level of government was totally committed to and and owned by. Um, you, you know the ownership class. So guess what happens? So uh, the um, the disenfranchisement that we saw through, uh, uh, let's say, you know, literary te uh, li literacy tests mm -hmm. or whatnot, right. or poll taxes, um, they they are they are aimed they 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 disenfranchise um, black people writ large, and then uh, basically poor whites mm -hmm. uh, who are and and this is a almost like a, a, a rear guard action to sort of shut the door once, uh, once they're in power. I mean, we, right. No, we exactly. Have, That's a good way to put a, it. Yeah. We, we sort of have a, uh, a contemporary model for this. Right. Uh, yep. <laughs> people are wondering, I mean, we're, we're, we're literally watching this. I feel like in, in, in real time, uh, you know, this is a, a um, right. you know, they get into the, they have the Supreme court and, um, right. Uh, that door gets shut again. To make well, sure that this gets locked in. Right. Well, and look, I mean, that's one of the differences between right and left in this country at this point, right? right at least, or what, 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 what I often refer to now as whatever that thing is that occupies a cultural space that a left would occupy in the U.S. if <laughs> yeah. there were one. Right. Right. <clears throat> right. Because the right has a vision that, that they're mobilizing around. And they want to impose it, and they want to make the world in their image, where the left has no vision. So we don't think to do to do stuff like that. Uh, but but I want to say one thing about the disfranchisement thing thing too, or just dis, or disfranchisement comparison too, if you don't mind. And it's this, like, and I've been hammering on this point in my classes for a while, and I think it's useful, um, you know, for us all, um, you know, to reflect on it for for a moment or two. That disfranchisement in 2020, much like this franchisement in, in 1895, was a means to an end. And certainly it was part of the fabric of white supremacy or the restoration of, of absolute um, governing class power under the sign of white supremacy at, at the end of the 19th century. But if blacks had voted dependably democratic by some percentage, not even a majority necessarily, um, then the white supremacists or, 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 or the reimposition of absolute class power under the sign of white supremacy would probably 
have happened anyway, but it's less likely that disfranchisement, what would have been one of its principal weapons, right? And by the same token now, and I just wrote something uh, about this with respect uh, you know, to Nikki Haley, uh, what, uh, the former governor of South Carolina. Um, she's she's gotten quite huffy when people in South Carolina have suggested that there's a racial motive uh, that underlies their uh, attempts to purify the um, electorate and 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 uh, to suppress voting. And, and I'm sure that she's sincere, at least in the sense that people believe what they need to believe to do what they need to get done. But she could be sincere in in another more plausible sense too, in, but in that it's easy to see that now, and a lot of Republicans would say this you know, themselves, including Haley, she's shown it, that if more black people voted Republican, disfranchisement wouldn't, or, or that kind of disfranchisement, racialized disfranchisement, wouldn't necessarily be the mechanism of, 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 of choice to close the door and to lock in class power now. So so what's my point there? Well, my point there <clears throat> is that what, as I said about the Jim Crow South, while, while on one level, obviously and clearly, indisputably, race was, and, and uh, racism was what drove the Jim Crow order, but on another level, it really wasn't about race at all. Okay, so in, yeah. if, I, if I understand you, it's that, um, the uh, the disenfranchisement would not be the the um, the arrow if black people voted for Republicans. Now they're not going to right. uh, in the numbers that they want. But right. it, the fact that it's it's really just like how do we maintain power? And this right. is the low hanging fruit. It is right. No, that's to, right. Uh, uh, and and um, and it's also the. And, and and I want to actually get into you know some of the aspects of the book, but in a moment, mm -hmm. but this is this is sort of I guess uh, surrounds it too. I mean, I just read it's it's also sort of uh, that utility is also there to fight that disenfranchisement. Enfranchisement. In other words, I just read I, I have a headline uh, that uh, in Texas where they've reinstituted where they've instituted this sort of mail in uh, ballot. The, right. They've changed the, the the laws, and the spoiled vote um, tally has gone from like one percent to like thirty percent. Right, and and they're also finding a racial gap here. Mm -hmm. Right, and that headline, without the racial gap, it doesn't seem to gain as much traction mm -hmm. as uh, the one with the racial gap. But it's still right. Equally anti-democratic, right? In small right, D, that's right. And right. it's still you know, extremely problematic, and it's still going to empower uh, the right. the Republicans in their uh, in their agenda. Um, but part of it is that, like, we didn't have a 1965 for you know uh, for for white people. I mean, women had right. their vote, you know, uh, right. 50, uh, 20, 30, 40 years earlier, and so it doesn't have the same resonance to just say like, Hey, wait a second. There's clearly voter disenfranchisement here. Right. Um, and, uh, but without the, the, the sort of racial, it doesn't, um, it doesn't resonate in the same way. And it's just sort of like, this is just the easiest way for them to do it. I mean, I think that well, guy, yeah, th there was yeah. a guy caught on camera by, I think mm -hmm. like the daily show a North Carolina um, right. uh, official who's like, right. yeah, well, of course we, we did that because we didn't right. want the black people to vote. And it's because, you know, they're Democrats. Um, right. Oh, yeah. In fact, they, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, there's one of, well, well, one of the morons like in North Carolina actually wrote, wrote to the justice department and asked for a list of precincts where blacks predominated. And then they produced a redistricting plan that that disfranchised all those precincts. So it was so transparent there. Oh, it's too stupid to live, basically. But uh, uh, yeah, I see where you're going with this. And look, I mean, this is part of the Catch-22, man. I agree. Uh, uh, yeah, in in the midst of a street fight, you pick up whatever's around that you can use, right? But again, this, this takes us back to the problem that, that I mentioned at the beginning, that the right has some place that they're trying to go. So they 
will make use of the low-hanging fruit, but they'll connect that in one way or another, in whatever way, mainly through the through through the improvisational dynamics of coalition formation. They'll they'll connect that to to this strategy for getting to where they want to get ultimately, right? Um, and, and you put your thumb on the problem too that 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 the only language that that we have legally to protest uh, inequality is a language based on what I've described as categories of ascriptive difference, like categories based on what you supposedly are instead of what you do. So race, gender, sexual orientation, et cetera. Um, and that kind of feeds the disparitarian understanding of what inequality is, right? Um, but, but that all depends on or the success of that approach depends not on building a broad political alliance to challenge for power, but it depends on 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 appellants having the ear of the sympathetic voices in the ruling class, in the courts, in Congress, or whatever, who who can make things happen you know, outside of a majoritarian context, and and we can't. You know, we haven't been able to depend on that for thirty years, right? And we certainly can't can't now. And, and that's why I think that part of what has to happen, and this is what, pardon the shameless plug, but our podcast, classmatters.org, or the Class Matters podcast, um, is is focused on. Um, well, I mean, our tagline is, uh, "What would the country look like if if it were." governed by and for the working class. And we're trying to find ways to start, you know, getting around the identitarian you know, uh, roadblocks uh, and sort of catching working people before they get drawn into uh, Trumpism, basically. And that's and what we've got to do. Yeah. Do you feel like, I mean, the, the flat, the flattening, I guess, of that, those power dynamics, exacerbates or even worsens you know some of the ways that the right has been able to make gains um with uh voter suppression like in this current day i mean i know that the history of it, 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 it that 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 might be part of you know why it's such an uphill battle right now mm -hmm. oh, oh i'm sorry uh uh, uh that's what do you mean by the flattening of the power dynamics yeah just like making it you know uh it, more only about anti-racism oh yeah 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 the class right yeah uh oh uh, yeah i think absolutely uh, um and in fact a you know, good friend and colleague of mine in south carolina and i did an article he did m most of the work actually a few years ago on this uh you know, after working in south carolina for a long time and noticing that democrats and republicans black and white are, are equally committed to race being the central fault line um, for for political differentiation in you know, in the state, uh, my colleague uh, 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 the professor Willie Leggett, who I mean by the way, like if there were a Nobel Prize for for uh, apothems, he, uh, he would have won it uh, for 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 saying a few years ago that the only thing that hasn't changed about black politics since 1965 is how we think about it, and he's absolutely correct about that. But like he went back um, to V.O. Key's classic study of s Southern politics in 1949 called Southern Politics in, in, in State and Nation and found the passages, the pages where Key describes the role that race played in South Carolina politics in 1949. And what we figured out was with a very small handful of individual word changes, right, it, what in those passages, you, you you could say just about the same thing about South Carolina race in South Carolina politics now that it's um, used as uh, you know, what the field sisters call the surface camouflage to conceal the political, economic, and class dynamics that are really driving what what uh, I mean in driving the society, and, and I think that's true nationally, and you know like for something else I was just trying to work on uh, you know, I was stunned to find out. That, that apparently the Census Bureau stopped keeping records on l labor force participation by race at some point before 2020. So it's just all about, and, and, 
And even even when you look at local economic data uh, but, you know, under the economy, what what you see is, is like businesses, um, but 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 you got to do some extra digging around to find out anything about employment. So this is like part of a bipartisan program, basically, to make the working class uh, uh, um, uh, uh, I mean, disappear. It's also part of the contemporary anti-racist program, right? I mean, since 2016, <clears throat> um, the the black chattering class and 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 I. And as, as best exemplified by Joanne Reed, like on MSNBC, has has been insisting that working class is a euphemism for white racist, which means, among other things, you can't be black black and be in a working class. You can only be black, and what be and 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 to the extent that the so-called black agenda is set by the, the investor class, well, we kind of see how that plays out, don't we? Right, right. That's where the wealth gap comes from when, w- despite the fact that we know that three-fourths of so-called black wealth is held by the 10, 10% or, or, or the richest 10% of black people, and three-fourths of white, so-called white wealth is held, by the, is held by the richest 10% of white people, and the bottom half of blacks and whites have, have no wealth whatsoever, and 96% of black wealth is held by the richest 20% of black people. So what does narrowing uh, uh, the wealth gap do for anybody who has to work for a living? Uh, so, so yeah, like it's from all around us, right? And, and, uh, and uh, that's the reason that, that, that my colleagues and I have been um, you're describing uh, um, an anti-racist discourse as a, you know, as a species of ne- neoliberalism at this point. I mean, it's interesting. The the I don't know if it's the irony, but the the and it's certainly not a coincidence, maybe. But the uh, when when you talk about um, uh, Joy and Reed or any uh, mm-hmm. folks who are using, you know, uh, who, who who perceive the the working class as uh, as um, as just white supremacists, um, uh, it, it it excludes black working class people. It also happens on the other side, <laughs> I think, where people are arguing like, you know, you have some people who are arguing Democrats need to appeal more to the working class. Right. Some of those people are basically just also, it seems to me, erasing black working class people. Right. Um, I mean, right. it's it, it sort of it, it's a it's a project that really brings people together, I guess. Um, well, well, I mean, I'll tell you, that's like a throwback. That's a very important point, too, Sam. And that's like a throwback to that moment at the end of the 80s and the beginning of the 90s when what when it when in the earlier incarnation of clintonism right uh, a a chunk of the driving line was that the democrats needed to get away from you know, from their association with minorities labor and and feminists right and this is just another version of the same thing so yeah there's, so there's a Scylla and a Charybdis out there, and 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 we have to navigate very carefully through through the strait between them. Well, let's. I, I mean, just because you did say identitarian uh, roadblocks, and is that mm-hmm. what you mean there? That this is just like it is. Um, it's a dis- it's a it, it's a distraction or it's a misdirection on some level, and we can't address the underlying sort of, or or we can't even see necessarily the underlying dynamic if right. we we. Because we're making some type of category error, I guess, in terms of like yes. what is driving. Yes, I would say that, and I would also say that burned into my brain is the image of um, God. What's his name? Van Jones falling to his knees and weeping when he got that hundred million dollar check from Jeff Bezos, right? I mean, this is a class program, right? It it it's a class politics that's dressed up at. At, at, as a race politics, which is what race politics always is. It, it was um, late 19th century white supremacy was a class politics dressed up as a race politics. Early 21st century anti-racist politics is a different kind of class politics dressed up as a different kind of race politics. So where does, and I, 
I like uh, how we're naming names on the show today. Oh well, I, yeah, it's all right. I mean, uh, you know, like I, I, I distinctly. Oh, I'm remember, old. That's what old people do. So I'm just channeling I, I, my I grandmother. Dan Jones once. I remember this very distinctly because I did it in my basement. It was just when this was an audio uh, show only, and uh, he he had just spoken at Netroots Nation. This must have been ten years ago or eight years ago, and it was developing a a uh, he wanted to create a group to fight. Uh, like the the Tea Party, mm, he was sort of okay. in a stage where he was challenging Glenn Beck, and I remember mm. distinctly asking him, like, "Okay, so so who's the enemy here? Like, I mean, who right. is doing? There is no enemy, right. I think, is what he said." And I was just like, "Wait, what? Yeah. How do you? What? <laughs> this is all just sort of like like the weather? Like, yeah. I don't understand." Um, well, yeah. I tell you what, man. Like when I worked in Manhattan and lived partly in in New Haven. Uh, every day on your Metro North in Stanford or between Stanford and Greenwich, uh, you know, I would ride past you know, on a train uh, the world I mean, headquarters of, of WWE, the World Wrestling uh, right, Enterprise. And that's what that politics is, 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 is to me. But right? that's what Van Jones, what, I mean, debating Glenn, what Glenn Beck is, basically. It's theater. Well, but let me let me speak in defense of WWE. Well, well, in fact, they should have debated in Jello. That's part of well, but that's I mean that's I mean frankly that's part of like you know what we do here is is partly that that element. But like at the very least, do it well in my estimation. Right. Like have right. some, there has to be some value to it. If you're not, he's not all he's doing is fighting Glenn Beck. He's not fighting what Glenn right. Beck stands for. Is problematic. It, that right. was my issue with it. Like, right? I, I yeah, I, I hear you. I don't, I don't mind the the theater. I do right. also remember one time I was on a uh, a program where I was sitting next to a guy who I only knew him as a fundraiser for Obama. And we got mm. into a big argument about um, uh, about the uh, estate tax, and he was saying like the the estate tax is is hindering intergenerational oh wealth transfer. Oh my god! Oh my god! People. And I'm like, what are you talking about? And we got into like this. This oh my big, god! Attracted argument that happened, and he's like, "The CP, the uh, the Congressional Black uh, uh, Caucus uh, supports it, and we're we're arguing." I'm like, "I don't care who who supports it. It's right. ridiculous." We're arguing right. through the commercial break, and it wasn't until afterwards when I got home that I googled the guy and found out that he was like, like number one or two, like wealthiest black uh, <laughs> men in the entire country. Like he was worried about his kids getting right, like right. The full. <laughs> Like, you know, like they're going to lose out on, they're only going to get like 30 or 50 million each in, uh, you know, if, this, if these taxes go through. And I was just like, yeah. wow. All right. Well, so uh, you write that there's like almost like two opposite misunderstandings of Jim Crow hmm. uh, to, to, to get back into this, because mm -hmm. this is, yep. um, what were they or what are they? Well, yeah, one, one, one is the happy faced one, right? That, that, that it solved all of our problems and, the, and, and there's no more inequality or that's unjust anymore, right? The end of Jim Crow. The, right. The, the, that, that, okay. Oh, oh, yeah. Sorry. Right. Um, and the other it is is that the victories didn't amount to anything, right? That they didn't mean anything. Uh, and 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 I've been hearing the latter um, line pop up, especially among young people, because, you know, young people don't know anything, but they think they know a whole lot uh, you know, for 30 years now. And my knee jerk reaction has always been god i wish i could what i wish i had a way back machine and i could drop you like in the mississippi delta in 1950 and then come back six weeks later and pick you up right um so there's that kind of misunderstanding but and the other what uh, and the other misunderstanding uh, i guess is more or, or or is either more naive or naive in a different way but it stems from partly from a fundamental you know, misunderstanding of the roots of inequality, even those inequalities that manifest as 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 racial, right? Uh, and, and 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 my friend, the historian Barbara Jean Jean Fields, has often said that for for a long time now, the way that people in this country talk about slavery or Jim Crow, one would think that the point what was to produce racism, right? Not, you know, cotton and rice and sugarcane, right? So we've kind of in, in, inverted the understanding of the relation between racial bigotry, 
and the social order out of which racial bigotry emerges and makes sense. And, um, and I think one of the things I've tried to convey in the book is that um, it is that race is an ideology. It's not a thing, of course. It's historically specific. It comes into uh, comes into existence in certain historical moments and political economic contexts. And and while the word stays pretty much the same, uh, you know, uh, you know the content that attaches to the word changes right over time. Um, and um, and it and race or racism fundamentally cannot cause anything because they are abstract ideas that don't have the capacity to, to make anything happen, right? They, what well, the ideologies appeal to people because they, they emerge out of a sort of common sense cauldron, right? Uh, but such that you l look around and see who is positioned where uh, you know, on the social hierarchy. And race is a taxonomic discourse that 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 provides a natural seeming explanation uh, for why who is wherever they are sh should be there, right? It's supposed to be there, and like all such ideologies, um, it 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 gains currency and becomes dominant when it comports with, with the sensibilities of powerful interests right in the society who want to propagate it and use it. Um, if, 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 if race did not, if racism did not provide the desired outcome by wealthy people, they would move on to something else. Totally. Uh, and, and, totally. and, 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 okay. So here's my, uh, um, uh, dilemma. And then I can bring it back to Jim. Crow oh yeah, sure. Too. But, 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 but here's, so I, I subscribe to, to that notion. And, and, and in some ways, I think everybody, a, a lot of anti-racists do too and don't necessarily realize. I mean, because you always hear like, nobody's born racist. You're taught right. to be racist. Right. Well, if that's the case, the question is like, why? And mm -hmm. uh, and if it's not endemic, the, the question is like, why are you being taught to be, uh, be racist? And it is, um, you know, it may on the micro level have be like, well, it's a tradition in our family. Mm -hmm. You know, we like, the, yeah. we like to be racist. But somebody was taught to be racist and it, and it was, it was used as a tool, mm -hmm. but, but does that mean, but, but it doesn't necessarily follow that if racism is taught to be a tool that you can bypass the implications of that belief system that has now been reproduced for the benefit of mm -hmm. maintaining a power dynamic that has to do with money and class. Right. Does it, but doesn't necessarily follow that you can bypass that and just deal directly with um, power in terms of, of money mm. and class. But, but, uh, or right do here. you need to sort of like go back in, like almost like, you know, I turn my shirt inside out. I can't, I gotta, I gotta turn it back inside <laughs> in before right. I can put it on. Well, I know that's what a lot of anti-racist educators and like others say, a lot of anti-racist I mean, activists, uh, what somebody I read not that long ago, um, said that you know, you know, you know, you know, our job is as as progressive activists or as leftists it is is to win white people to the understanding of how they've messed over black people, um, and 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 that's but uh, but but the question that you ask really gets down to an organizing question, right? Uh, and and I think that that. That, that you kind of split the difference between the two approaches that you suggest, right? That, that is, that to build a broad alliance, right? Well, well it's like trying to organize a shop, basically, right? That, that you start out from, from, from the issues and concerns that people have, have in common, right? And through the course of struggling to advance those issues and concerns, both in a positive sense and, of course, in a negative one, one too, that then you build the kinds of solidarities that make it easier to confront directly the vestiges or the more than vestiges, the actual bigoted sensibilities that individual people have. Uh, and, I mean, a couple things about that. One is that, that you know, that's an approach 
that doesn't begin from the uh, from the assumption that to build a movement you got to turn people into saints first basically uh, at, as i've often said it's not like we're trying to pledge a frat here right or to rush a frat like we're trying to so we don't need everybody to believe the same thing coming in right the point is is that through the course of building and broadening the struggle people come to see things differently and like, this is the petty comparison, I suppose. Some people might think it's kind of romantic, but I mentioned uh, this at least once or twice in the book, that, that at this point, right, for the last 30 years, right, I have noticed, I've sometimes registered, when I see you know, interracial groups of people out in the South, friends, coworkers, neighbors, whatever, you know, having drinks at a TGI Fridays or a softball game together, yeah, I recall that this is a level of sort of almost trivial but mundane interaction that would not have been possible as early or as late as 1960, at least. And that was partly the point of Jim Crow. Like when we you know, started working and organizing campaign in South Carolina in 2006, you spent a lot of time working flea markets, which are, you know, working class shopping malls, basically. And we were struck right away at how m much evidence there was of current and former like interracial coupling, right? Uh, but in that place, I mean, what, what I often mention is one woman, like a, um, um, a grandmother, a white grandmother who looked like she was straight out of the uprising of 34, uh, sitting with her little uh, you know, mixed race black grandbaby and, and, and 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 much greater copious right right uh, uh, um, evidence right all up and down the working class and i was reminded that uh yeah well pitchfork ben ben tillman and cole Blees and those guys knew what they were doing because they understood that when people are in common circumstances it it's it's as likely that they will align which is after all the thing they've been frightened to death of since 1865 uh, it's more likely that they'll align on on their own than than not. So, so the focal point of politics comes to center on making sure that they don't align, and that's what's coming from the right now too. So, so okay, and 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 when, when you put it in the context of of organizing and you mm -hmm. in, in, in a in, in a shop, um, it it makes a lot of sense to me, right? You don't come in and highlight any uh, the differences. You highlight right. shared experiences that everybody's having in there, right. and allow those shared experiences to overcome any type of uh, you know prejudice or, or predispositions or racial right. animus or whatever it is over time. Right. But in ter it, but but in terms of like sort of you know the twenty thousand foot uh, type of thing, like where it's not from as a as an organizing, let's say tactic. But mm -hmm. in terms of a, um, I guess, like a sort of broader intellectual fight to mm -hmm. um, to influence maybe marginally like legislation or regulation that will set up, make it easier for you to walk into that shop. And, and mm -hmm. um, uh, or, uh, you know, as like you say, you're in a street fight, you pick up the first thing you see. The, you mm -hmm. know, uh, right. And, and um, how is it? How is it problematic on that level, right? Like, I mean, how is right. it problematic? I mean, right. frankly, like when you're talking about like organizing a shop, how is it problematic that like a New York Times op-ed writer or whomever, you know, mm -hmm. uh, you know, is 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 obscuring this dynamic at least in that way as a, you know, the, the, or this or, or obscuring really what you would do tactically or material like in terms of what right. you do as opposed to like the thoughts right. associated well that's important too sam i mean i'll say a couple things um one is i do see that charles blow gives the boogaloo boys bulletin board material at least what once every other week so that doesn't help us right but um so i think we're at a point now well so, no the thing is we got to be able to do both things at the same time and the problem with whatever that blob is that occupies the cultural space, et cetera, is that it doesn't do that and it hasn't done that. So so much of what is represented as left politics is purely performative and, and, and frankly, as a Potemkin quality, right? Like it's done 
to to affect um, the cable news cycle, right? Uh, right now, much more than it's done, you know, uh, 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 to try to generate a base and and and, and uh, to move people. And there's often a career imperative that's involved as well, right? I mean, just look at the history of Black Lives Matter, for instance, which shouldn't have been that hard to see. Um, so, but um, here's the thing. So like last summer, I published an article called The Whole Country is a Reichstag uh, in a in, in non-site. And part of my argument there is that we've got, we may well have reached a point at which ne neoliberalism is no longer capable of delivering enough for for enough of the population to sustain its legitimacy as a nominally democratic order, and and in that case, what happens is like so. When I go for a walk here. There's like a T intersection about three blocks from my apartment. So I think about it every day. Um, that 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 we may well be at the political equivalent of a T intersection where. There's only two directions to go. One is right, and that's toward, toward authoritarianism. And the other is at, at least in a kind of New Dealish social, uh, I mean, democratic sensibility that would in, encourage toward um, a public good understanding of, 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 of government. And one of the things that, that's definitely come through in our work, but I think it comes through from all the anti-vax stuff too, is that working people in, in this country have pretty much lost, seem to have lost faith in the idea that government can do anything decent for them. Yeah. And if we don't begin to restore that, right, then it doesn't matter what, what, how, what, how the public interest groups might get Congress to, well, but to move the, or, 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 or to shift the playing field like two decimal points to the right. In, in our direction, right? Because the right's still going to win, uh, you know, win the game ultimately. And so, so I mean, that's why uh, I mean, that's why I say we've got to be able to do both things at the same time. You've got to be able to, to 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 like understand and see. This is why I thought those you know, I could never vote for Biden. People are crazy, uh, and I'm irresponsible. And God knows what. Well, I'm no fan of Joe Biden, right? Um, or or the wing of the party that he uh, that he uh, 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 um, he represents, and and it's an odd feeling to think that on domestic policy the left wing of the Biden administration is uh, represented by Brian Dees and BlackRock I mean, the asset managers, and maybe on foreign policy the left wing of the Biden administration might be John Mearsheimer. Yes, but right, but um, but. But that's the reality that we have. There's to only two directions, and 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 we right. should say to continue that 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 uh, uh, that that metaphor or, uh, mm -hmm. that it is also conceivable. People should understand that you could take that authoritarian turn, and actually, you know, improve things along the lines of anti-racism, -race, right? Like, I mean, mm -hmm. it, you know, I mean, that would be, and you know, there would. You could theoretically sure have that guy I was sitting next to. I can't von Peebles, Peebles was it Peebles or something? That guy I was sitting next to on right. that show. Yep, he could just be like, "Yeah, no, I mean we're." And I think at one point, like he did, he started like raising money for Mitt Romney. And yeah. um, after Obama, after the first four years, because he didn't get his, uh, it was Don Peebles, and okay. um, he, and 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 theoretically. He could he he would be sure. he could be okay in that authoritarian uh, uh, turn, as opposed to the right. There's just nothing being offered on that level, uh, on that plane of decision. Essentially, that 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 the 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 nominal left in this country, you know, centered to the left mm -hmm. as we have it in this country, is offering right. in a concrete way. I mean, there was a I mean, Biden seemed to make an attempt. Um, but you know, uh, you know, uh, people could argue as to, um, you know, how ambitious or how sincere it was, but, uh, build back better right. was at least, you know, providing some of that material support yeah. that, right. that, uh, um, would, would have gone that way. I mean, um, I, I, I had so much more I wanted to ask you about, um, 
the well, but I'm sorry, like, I'm not letting us talk about the book. No, so no, well, so, I mean, um, it's, um, this is self destructive behavior. But I mean, I, I think I think a lot of these themes are sort of um, embedded yeah. in your experience of Jim Crow and, and the mm -hmm. experience of Jim Crow. And we should say, I know you wrote this because you are, or you, she, essentially, the last cohort to have actually mm -hmm. lived there. All right. Well, right. let me just ask one more question that I think will sort of like tie into this too. Okay. Is that um, you, you you write in the book that in the course of Jim Crow and 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 you have this idea of like one obviously you want to keep uh, black people and white people separate because. Mm -hmm. You don't want them saying like, hey, wait a second. Yeah, no, I I, right. I have trouble making ends meet at the end of the month or right. this is costing too much. But also that um, the, there was not the agenda was not to keep black people separate from the economy, but to play right. a specific role in that context. Um, right. Will you will you speak to that? Because I think that sort of like bridges a little bit of what we've been saying. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And frankly, like the view that that the point of of the segregationist order was to uh, what was <clears throat> pardon me what what was to exclude blacks from the society entirely has given uh, over the years given uh, rise to two two distinct pathologies uh, i mean one of them is the view well yeah uh well uh, uh, yeah the view that that uh um that the more reasonable course for uh, advocates of black cons black interests, concerns, whatever, uh, through the courts would have been, instead of challenging the legality of separate but equal on 14th Amendment grounds, to um, focus on demanding a strict, in strict enforcement of separate but equal doctrine. And I mentioned that in the book, and my point there is that, well, that just fundamentally misunderstands what the point of the regime was, right? right? The point of the regime, like separate but equal is never anything more than a fig leaf, right? To get past the 14th and 15th Amendments on, on paper to give Northern liberals um, what would a basis for winking and nodding. Um, the other one is that, that, that Blacks should secede um, formally or you know, informally from the main line of the American economy and do their own thing, basically. A and that fundamentally but a misunderstands that actually the point of segregation, as was the point of slavery, frankly, was not to separate black people from the economic life of the nation, but was to reduce them to a labor force that had no rights, right? Much much in the same way that that illegal uh, that that illegal immigration works today, right? I, um, well, at a friend of mine in in in, uh, in uh, the worker center movement, what was often said to white work or, or to American workers or whatever color, that look, it's not that the immigrants are taking your your job. What's happening is that the employer is turning your job into a job that only somebody with no rights or options whatsoever would be eligible for, right? And that's what the point 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 of the Jim Crow system was. And that was one of the, you know, some people call it a tra tragedy. I don't, you know, I don't give them that much credit. But one of the things about uh, uh, the Booker T. Washington line, what 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 was that? He convinced himself, and it was easy to convince himself because uh, he got all the good stuff. That that it was possible for 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 blacks to abjure demands for citizenship rights, right? Uh, and and in the interstices, create a vibrant um, black business class, basically. You know, often with with fantasies of a you know of all black towns, all black st states, or whatever. Uh, but that fundamentally misunderstands the relation between politics and economics. And just as it, it, it did in 1890, it does in 2022. It, it just fundamentally under, misunderstood the fact that like, n this is not a question of, um, this is not a question of uh, people don't want, uh, you know, the, the white ruling class does not want black people around. It, 
It right. wants them around, but <laughs> only to right. serve a very specific right. purpose. Right. Exactly. Right. Exactly. Um, Adolf Reed, the um, the book is called The South, Jim Crow and Its Afterlives. It is, as I have deemed it, an autoethnography. Uh, <laughs> That's a lot uh, better than memoir, so thank you very much. <laughs> well, I know. I've, 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 I've heard that you don't like that. And so, no, uh, not at all. <laughs> uh, but it is, it, is, it, is a, uh, it is a view at Jim Crow from essentially the ground and mm -hmm. um and how it uh you know created these circumstances on a on, on a daily basis uh to achieve a lot of the things that we've been talking about i really appreciate you coming on today uh, uh it's a great pleasure to see you oh and um yeah, uh, uh yeah likewise i enjoyed the conversation and thanks a lot for having me All right, we are back. Sam Cedar on the Majority Report. Um, joining us is the, and I, I'm not sure of his specific title, but um, he is the leader of the movement Birds. I'm the public information officer for Birds Aren't Real. The public information officer for Birds Aren't Real, Peter McIndoe. Uh, Peter, thank you for, for joining us. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you're welcome. I'd like to ask you, before you control the narrative in this conversation, why are you having me on the show? I know you. I looked you up. I Googled you. I know you're with the media. So why do you? Well, yeah, you, I, you, yeah, you have me on your show to laugh at me? No, no. Um, we, we had it. Bring, bringing the bird guy on the show to laugh at him? No, uh, no not bringing you on to laugh at you, Peter. Uh, it, and honestly, there's no reason for you to be that defensive. Uh, brought you on because uh, this week we did have a writer on talking about uh, who had done a extensive book on people who believe in the flat earth theory. And I thought uh, it might be a good follow up to have someone on who believes in another theory. And that theory uh, give you a full opportunity to discuss what you what that theory is. I mean, folks, you see how the media does it, you know, <laughs> you see, I would have preferred maybe to be compared to, hey, look, look at Guggenheim, who made progressions with the atom, you know, here's people in history who have done important things. Here's here's revolutionaries. George Washington ever heard of John Adams? But no, I get compared to the flat earth, the people who believe the earth is flat. There, I. Okay, all right. Just, that's a fair. That's a fair critique. I just want people watching this to see to see how they do it. They put me up next to the next to the flat Earth people, and then they have me talk. Okay, uh, um, right. that's that's a, that's a fair critique. I am sorry about that. I will let you. Um, I don't know what controversial uh, theory that Sam Adams had, or John Adams, or, or oh, George. Yeah, he, he at the time, was very controversial. Three. Uh, it was set freedom. That was the name he had. It was very controversial at the time. The times weren't with it. Well, you know what he did? He oh, went. He used to, he stormed the he stormed the British gates. He had no fear, and he took over and made the United Land of America. And that was controversial at the time. Well, what I'm doing is controversial. But frankly, oh, I understand. Uh, but I mean, to be fair, Peter, like the there's there's. The, the idea that you're both controversial is not, I think, a fair uh, comparison. He was controversial because he had an opinion and an ideology, but you are making some factual assertions that, um, and, and why don't you tell people what those factual assertions are? I mean, there's no reason to be this combative. Okay. I just, I just know how the establishment lib media works. Okay. I know. You and Al Roker and Chris Cuomo and your big your big establishment buddies are all are all hanging out laughing at the little guy. So you know I'm not trying to come on combative. I just I looked you up. I know that you're with okay the I'll Turks, the young Turk. I just, I just, I'm just being cautious. I'm just no. being cautious. I want to share my ideas. I just to be quite. I mean I don't want to come on your show defensive. I'm sorry. I just 
clip. We can play a clip of. Can we play the clip, please? This is a clip of. Uh, you, we can do the the one from when you were on television on a local uh, station, or uh, or we can do. Yeah, the, here. This is from live, like a uh, three. What channel three? Channel three. Where is this channel? Okay. Well, let's just play it. Consider myself to be an average American. I wake up in the morning, wash my car, and I have an avid disbelief in avian beings. Maybe you've seen the billboard near the Highland Strip or heard the story on Wednesdays Live at 9. A campaign called Birds Are Not Real brings its efforts to the Mid-South. And this morning, we are joined by one of the messengers of the movement. Peter McIndoe is here to tell us how this all came about. We want to emphasize you were not the founder. No, ma'am. We put the billboard here because we wanted to bring it to the biggest city in the world, you know, the Paris of the West. Uh, so we brought it to Memphis, Tennessee. From 1959 through 2001, the government mercilessly genocided over 12 billion birds and simultaneously replaced them with surveillance drones in disguise. Sometimes I'll travel internationally, go to the Himalayas, just to breathe the drone-free air. So this is really satire. I mean, you don't really believe that that happened, correct? This is a satirical uh, campaign to make the point that what? <laughs> you're, you're looking at me like, no, it's not satire. I really do believe this. <laughs> Honestly, it's kind of offensive. Okay. Um, okay. We do not well, find this to be a okay. humorous right. issue. There, we, let's. Okay. So, so there it is. There's. Uh, so the your your assertion is that the United States government has killed all the birds and replaced them with drones. Is that right? That's right. And as you can see, I've had some bad experiences with the media. You know. Um, so that's where my that's where my defensiveness comes from. I'm often brought on to be laughed at. So uh, just coming on with go with my guard up. But yeah, that's my that 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 is what our movement stands for. If you really want to know it's it, we talk about how the United States government wiped out uh, 12 billion birds. They extinguished them and, and whisked them out like a light bulb. And uh, well, they had crop dusting airplanes. I mean, this OK. If you really want to get into the facts, people can look this up. And this is not information that. You know, the media usually wants out there. So, Sam, thanks for giving the platform. Um, you know, uh, frankly, a lot of your viewers, I know a lot of you are on YouTube looking for truth like a lot of us. I am, too. Um, and uh, it, but the, the real truth can be found in documents and tapes that only I have access to, along with a couple other people, unfortunately, that reveal that the United States government uh, launched crop dusting airplanes across the United States. Wait a second. Wait a second. Why do you have access to these documents and, 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 and only a few other uh, uh, people? Why don't you release these documents? I mean, these documents were I mean, we have released some. We released the, we released the Poultry Gate email leak of early 2021 where huge Hollywood elites, uh, politicians I, I, I ever heard of Ted Cruz. Um, were involved in, in the bird drone surveillance crisis. It revealed a lot. It revealed that they're hollowing out the mountains around America and putting uh, drone factories inside the hollowed out mountains. Hollywood elites were involved in the making of the drone factories inside the mountains. I don't know if you're familiar with, um, some would say America's greatest renovator named uh, Ty Pennington from Extreme Home Makeover. The United States government consulted him to renovate the insides of most mountains in America, renovate them out and turn them into drone surveillance factories. And if people would turn off their freaking TVs and stop watching these, these, these freaking talking heads and actually look into, I mean, the actual research, you know, if you start asking why a couple times, things start falling apart, you know, real quick. With well, the let, whole me ask, let me ask, why would you have a drone factory inside a mountain why wouldn't you just have it in a drone factory well you see you see sam because if you were to have massive bird drone factories with workers out in public i mean we're making 12 billion drones here you know that's a lot of drones and don't that's how many drones don't you need workers huh? in mountains, in the hollowed out mountains? Isn't it workers doing it in the hollowed out mountains? I mean, what difference does it make if it's in a factory or a hollowed out mountain factory? 
a lot of land space. I mean, it takes an incredible amount of land mass. I mean, to make one bird drone, it takes, you know, roughly 10 by 10 yards for the machinery made, you know, you know, required. So we're talking. Imagine, imagine, imagine if you hollowed out the Appalachian mountains, truly how much land mass there would, there would be under that. You don't think people are tapped into that? Yeah. You don't think, you don't think some people have stumbled upon doorways. Have you seen the clips? So I went on a little hike. Went a little hike. I'm, I'm on the side of the mountain. Oops! Stumbled upon a doorway. I'm not uh, seeing. It. This happens to people all the time. What? Where can I see the clips of people stumbling onto doorways in the Appalachian Mountains? Oh, I mean, you have to do to do your own research. I don't know. I mean, I know you're you're probably on you know the big media uh, the big media websites, but man, there's a lot of great information out there uh, on. I mean, I. I really just get my information from birdsaren'treal.com because that's the one that I know I can trust. Uh, so, I mean, my website, yeah, my I do put the information. I mean, it's not I; it's not my information. I'm the one who goes on Squarespace and puts it on the website, but it's legitimate documents and emails. And I and you said that's the one place that you go to find information that you trust. You put the information up there. Yeah. I don't trust anybody but myself. My understanding is that you are also having a um, a rally that is upcoming, the Media Freedom March. The Media Freedom March, yeah, it's coming up. We're we're, we're excited about it. We had a lawsuit against the New York Times that was pretty um, highly publicized. Uh, I launched. Yes, I launched a full-fledged attack against the New York Times. They released a defamatory story about us. And, and you know what, Sam? I don't take that lightly. When the media... I'm just saying, man, I'm coming on this show um, expecting to be bashed. I'm standing in front of you right now, Sam, with 10 flaming arrows in my back. I've had the worst three months. The media's come after me from every angle. They're calling us a parody. They're calling us a joke. They're calling. They're calling me a, some kind of some kind of jokester, and I, um, you know, I don't think they would do that to any other movement around right now. So I mean, we launched. We launched. We launched. Lost, we launched lost, 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 libel. I'm sorry. We launched, lost, we, we launched lawsuits for libel. That's what you do when you get lied about on a mass platform. I reached out to, to my lawyers, Mo and Marley at Lieberman and Reese. And we got some stuff together um, and formally sued CNN and formally sued the New York Times. Um, and uh, I was feeling really uh, confident about it. I was feeling really good. Um, but then we got this email from the New York Times general counsel office that I didn't really understand that kind of brought me down to earth. Um, and we had to retract the lawsuit today, which sucks. Um, but... We are redirecting our energy outside of suing the corporation. We placed a curse on the journalist that smeared us, an ancient curse um, that's going to bring her pain in her life and suffering for generations. Um, and I hope it does cause her the, a fraction of the suffering she's caused me. Because when you lie about people on the front page of the New, of the New York Times, you know, I, you know what that I, does to a man? No, well, out I, in the streets? Yeah, I can imagine. But I, I got... I, I I don't think that you were on the front page of the New York Times. Look it up. See, this well, is the thing about the lib media. This this is the thing about the establishment lib media. Um, hey hey hey! If anybody's around the house, can you bring me a copy of the New York Times? Um, they don't they don't do they don't do their research. Uh, if you look it up. We were on the front page of the New, of the New York Times being blatantly who, lied. Who are you calling to bring you a page of the New York Times? No, oh, I've got some staff around here. We're, 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 we're around an Airbnb where we're having, we're organizing, we're doing some plans for the Media Freedom March that's, that's coming up. Because that, that's the thing. The media comes after you. They smear your name. Okay. What, how, how, how can you fight back? So you sue. You sue them. But then, oh, they have more money, and you don't. You don't have a case. Oh, you don't. You don't even have a case. Blah 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 blah. You know. Um, and then it goes from that to um, what else are you supposed to do except take to the streets, Sam? Except get out in the streets 
and I'm going to bring my van, I'm going to bring my son, and I'm going right to where I know all the media lives, probably where you have a house on this street I hear about over in, over in Hollywood called Hollywood Boulevard. All right, well, all listen, the- let me just say, I did not realize that there was, in fact, a, uh, an article, and uh, I apologize. Um, Thank you. December 10th, 2021, Section A, page one. Is this, is this true? Page Jim- one conspiracy with wings and a wink okay all right well uh then i i stand corrected i want to make that clear proven wrong once again by the truthers who will continue to tell the truth while the media will lie to you folks i want you to think about this guy you're watching every day this guy you're watching every day just told you a lie right in front of the guy's lying about and the hope that a good google and I hey cr- i respect i respect you for retracting i had to retract something today it happens in life you know, I had to retract a lawsuit today. It happens. Um, but I just want I just want people to treat us with a bit more respect and look at this pain and war that I've been brought through in the past three months where the entire media is ripping me apart all over the place. Then you try to sue them. You get told that you would actually get sued because you're, you're committing the actual libel. Ugh. And then, uh, yeah, so we're holding a media freedom march, a protest on Hollywood Boulevard. We're taking the fight to the media's front door on March 30th at 5.30 Pacific time. And anybody's invited. It's on Hollywood Boulevard. We're going to be out, in, out inside of the Chinese theater. I'm going to be there with my van. Um, and I'm just going to, you know, hey, since they won't let my voice be heard in the courtroom, it'll, the courtroom, it'll be heard on the streets. It'll be heard okay. on the streets. I, I want the streets of Hollywood to shake so much that the letters come tumbling down. The Hollywood sign letters come tumbling down from the hills like an avalanche. Okay. Well, um, good luck with that. And uh, it's uh, birdsaren'treal.com. Is that right? Birdsaren'treal.com. Come there for the only true sources of information you can find anywhere right now. Okay. Well, uh, Peter McIndoe, uh, thank you. Thank you for coming on and interesting, interesting theory. Thanks. All right. It might take all the strength I got to get to where I want, but I know somehow I'm going to get there. I wasn't looking when I just got caught between the truth and the light bar. Shifted in and out.